Welcome to Night Light. Step away from the mainstream and gather around as we enlighten the world and our realities and travel this cosmic journey we call life. Join us as we share with you and provide that beacon that can guide us all to a better way. Explore with us as we examine a metaphysical montage of spiritual insights covering everything from the mundane to the magical, UFOs to unicorns, and everything in between. This is a time of awakening, of sharing and evolving, of spreading our wings and soaring on the cosmic breath of creation. Come and join with other light-minded spirits as we weave our lights together to seek understanding, enlightenment, and with a little luck, some wisdom. This is Night Light, a reminder that you are never alone. Welcome to Nightlight, everybody, and we have Ken Quiethawk to thank for that amazing introduction. You can find him at nativestorytellers.com. He and his wife has, have a phenomenal website there, and it's important that we not forget some of the ways that ancient history has preserved our history. So check it out. Also, a gentle reminder that tomorrow Mark Eddy has Richard Balthazar on his show. It's going to be a humdinger, 10 o'clock, night light on Tuesday. Check it out. Tonight, however, we are delving into one of my favorite, favorite topics of all time with Dr. Greg Little. He's a psychologist turned explorer and documentary maker. Since 2003, Greg and his wife, Laura, have been actively searching the Bahamas for archaeological ruins that might be linked to Atlantis. Working with the Edgar Cayce organization, archaeologist Bill Donato, the Littles have conducted wide explorations around Bimini, Andros, and the Great Bahama Bank. Their explorations have been featured on the National Geographic Channel, the Learning Channel, MSNBC, Sci-Fi, Discovery, and the History Channel. Greg is co-author of the book, Edgar Casey's Atlantis, my most favorite book, by the way, Mound Builders, Ancient South America, and People of the Web, and has over 30 other books in print in various areas of psychology. Tonight we're going to be focusing on um, <clears throat> Edgar Casey's Atlantis, and Greg and John Van Auken present this story in an absorbing narrative of the legends of Atlantis and the latest discoveries in the ongoing search for remnants of the lost continents. This book contains over 100 illustrations, some never published before, and included in the story of Atlantis are vignettes of forgotten lands of Mu, Lemuria, Og, Zoo, and many others. Um, <clears throat> being, being addicted to Atlantis, I've read a lot of stuff about it, but this book is possibly going to become my Bible because, of course, um, it's based uh, fundamentally on the works of Edgar Cayce, whom I admire greatly, and it is so brilliantly done and the information so brilliantly put out there that anybody who has the least bit of interest in Atlantis should actually get this book and read it. It is amazing. It will, even though I have read a lot, there's information in here that I was not aware of. And he has pulled it together in a book that is so easy to read, so enjoyable to read, that, that most probably, along with many other people, I will read it over and over again. So welcome to the show, Greg. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting me back. Uh, it's been a few months, I believe, but I'm always yeah. willing to talk about this stuff. Uh, it's, I think it's very interesting stuff. Well, you know, the more I read about Atlantis, the more I understand that, first of all, I believe it existed, and second of all, it, it gives us an amazing pattern for the development of humanity that isn't any place else. 
Well, that's really true. Mainstream archaeology denies that there was anything really, any any civilization per se before the year 10,000 B.C., and they only <laughs> they only have agreed that something occurred in 10,000 B.C. because of the discovery in uh, Turkey of a site called Gobekli Tepe. But yeah. before, say, 2014, mainstream archaeology pretty much said civilization started no more than five or 6,000 years ago. So the story of Atlantis, uh, that was an advanced civilization that supposedly ended about 12,000 years ago. And there is really not much. Uh, mainstream archaeology doesn't accept it really at all. There are some archaeologists that do. Uh, and, of course, their main thing is, is that, oh, there's no evidence of it. Uh, the truth <laughs> is there is evidence here and there, but they just don't accept it. Uh, that that's the bottom line with that. But there's just, there isn't a lot of evidence. But then, what would you expect to find after twelve thousand years on Earth? Uh, there's you point to anything that last that comes from twelve thousand years ago, except maybe stone. There's not much else that remains, and there won't be much of current civilization twelve thousand years from now either. There may be something built no. on top of it, but there won't be much left. That's the problem. Well, you know, I think that that many people have heard the Disney version of oh, yeah. Atlantis. I mean, it's it's you know, big island, middle of the ocean, blew up, and we're searching for the crystals. But well, but, yeah, that that actually that Disney version. Is came from those are 1960s. It's like a 1960s movie, and then there were several variations of that made by others. Uh, some of that is based on a an interpretation of some of Edgar Casey's readings, uh, mm-hmm. say slavery and things or automatons, which we may get into here. Uh, and yeah. the crystals come from Casey. They, that is not part of Plato's story of Atlantis. And, of course, Plato is where it begins. Uh, but Casey gave us a, a much more detailed version of Atlantis. And the truth is there's nothing that Casey said about Atlantis that uh, contradicts anything Plato said. Plato never really gave a date for the beginning. He did talk about how it started uh, Casey talked about how it started, and with that, there are there are differences, uh, but you could still fit Plato's story into Casey's, and you can fit Casey's story into Plato, and they both fit very nicely. Uh, but oh, that, yeah. all those weird things about the crystals and the underwater devices, almost submarines, and some of the aircraft and so on in those At- Atlantis movies from the 60s, uh, they do come pretty much from Edgar Casey's visions, although we started reinterpreting some of Casey's readings and realized pretty quickly that some of the things that people interpreted as, say, airplanes or spaceships or high-tech submarines are not as high-tech as what everyone would think. Uh, some people have said that in, this crystal produced laser-like beams of light, but it it doesn't appear that way to a group of us that started reinterpreting Casey's readings for the ARE, by the way, which I got into this because I was asked by the ARE to take a look at Casey's readings on mound builders and the beginning of the Native American mound building culture. And because Casey did have, he had like 50 readings on that, uh, mm-hmm. And they asked me to see if any of that was valid or not. So that is how I got into the Atlantis material in the ARE. Uh, so it was really wow. through Indian Mounds. And I actually did not pay any attention to Casey's Atlantis readings at all or really any of his ancient history readings until around uh, around the year 2000 when I was asked to look into some of it. But up to that time, I really paid no attention to any of that other than Casey's health readings, and that's what he's best known as. Well, yeah, he he really was amazing, and his accuracy rate is so phenomenal that it's it's hard to not validate so much of this without any proof because of all of the things that, that he said, That act, especially even the medical things, um, my mother suffered from psoriasis, and when I looked up Casey's 
cure for right. it, I knew yeah. there was no way I was going to talk my mom into that. So, right. um, but but everybody that I have talked to that has utilized any <clears throat> any of his medical stuff, um, they find that it that is it is very valuable and often it really does help them a great deal and in many cases curing them. Um, so well, there are so there are his, a lot of research studies that physicians did. Uh, and medical researchers have done. In fact, Edgar Casey is known as the father of holistic medicine. Uh, that designation was given him in a publication put out by the American Medical Association, uh, and it, it relates to things like the use of castor oil, uh, mm-hmm. about dietary uh, balancing your diet, uh, alkalizing your body, those kinds of things, uh, watching the pH of your body. Uh, and Casey, Casey's health remedies are, are have been deeply studied. They're generally considered to be around 85 to 88 percent accurate. That doesn't mean that the the remainder, uh, maybe 15 to 12 percent, is inaccurate. It's that they really couldn't find out whether or not the remedies worked or not. But there's been a number of studies on that. Uh, so I've always been impressed with Casey's health readings. They're very very interesting. Uh, and until, two, like I said, until around the year 2000, I really wasn't interested in what he said about the ancient world, nor was I interested in uh, in what he said about humanity and consciousness and all that. I was more interested in how he got the power to uh, do these health readings uh, and assist a lot of people. That was my real interest. Which he had a he had a spiritual experience. Uh, he's one of those people who, when he was a child, who claimed to have to see little people, uh, to uh-huh. interact with spirits and so on. Um, and he had an experience at age 13, which is interestingly when, like Joan of Arc had hers, there are several other people who had uh, experiences at the age of 13 where some sort of entity like an angel appeared to them. And Casey had his experience in the woods and an angel he was reading the story of Manoah, which, by the way, is about an angel appearing to Manoah. Uh, he was reading that story in the woods, and the angel asked him what he'd most like to do, and he said he would like to help people and heal people. And the angel basically said, it will be yours. Now, he went home and told his mother about that. They were very, very fundamentalist Christians, uh, they were in Hopkinsville, Kentucky, very fundamentalist. His mother said, well, maybe that means you'll be a doctor, but let's not talk about this. Don't tell people, uh, So, which which was probably a good move. But Casey became oh, very yeah. well known in Hopkinsville as a, a teenager because he developed a rather unique ability. He could sleep on a book and memorize it. He had uh, an eidetic memory, uh, which... Uh, the story goes that he was able to sleep on a book and would absorb it, and then you could open the book, and then page after page, he could tell you exactly what was on each page, each word, word for word. Uh, he was tested in front of groups of people, uh, and he became almost a stage act in, in the Hopkinsville area and became very well known. Uh, he worked in a bookstore, lost his voice, uh, almost laryngitis, although there is no – no one really diagnosed why he lost his voice. And yeah, at that time, I'm losing you a little bit here. <laughs> okay, are we back? Sort of. Am I still here? Uh, talk, it's hard to tell. <laughs> okay, all right. Yeah. Can yeah, you hear me fine? Back. Excellent, now excellent, can, yeah. okay. Well, this was when when Casey was 21, he lost his voice. This is how he became how he got into these health readings and all of his psychic readings. Uh he lost his voice and at that time, uh it was 18, let's see, 77, 80, 90, 18, 98. At that time, mesmerism had developed and a lot of stage hypnotists were making the rounds and one appeared in Hopkinsville and he was asking for volunteers uh, from the audience, and all the people in the audience said, oh, take Edgar Casey," because he was so well-known. So Casey went up. He could not speak, and the hypnotist put him under very quickly and told him he could speak. Casey coughed, and he could speak plainly. Uh, and the hypnotist then told him, well, you'll be able to speak after this. Well, Edgar's voice left again. He could not speak again. 
But he then went to a local physician who hypnotized him in his office, and under hypnosis, the Edgar Casey that was laying on the couch told this hypnotist named Al, Al Lane to go ahead and suggest to him to diagnose his problem and suggest a remedy. So Lane gave him a hypnotic suggestion to diagnose the problem and come up with a remedy. And Casey coughed, and he said that I have the entity, that there was a circulation problem in the throat, that the hypnotist should suggest to him to increase the circulation in the throat. So the hypnotist then told Edgar to increase the circulation in his throat, there were a number of people there witnessing it, witnessing this, and they said his throat turned bright red. They then woke him up. He coughed up some blood, and then he could speak normally. So wow. this physician decided that, my gosh, if he can do that, maybe he can do this with others. So the first person that was diagnosed by Casey was the physician because the physician had these these digestive problems and stomach problems that he'd had for decades. So he he hypnotized Casey, had him diagnose his problem. Casey suggested a remedy, and it worked. It's the first time the physician had had any relief for decades. So word spread rapidly. Lots of physicians started coming to him, and they found out that that the person he was diagnosing didn't need to be in the room, they would simply tell Edgar the name of the person, where the person was. He would go into this trance, and then he would. It, it was. It became a very uh, organized and systematic method where he would say, "I have the body," and he he performed almost like a diagnostic scan on the body, and then told what the problem was, and then gave a remedy. And there are loads and loads of interesting stories about these remedies about how nobody could find them, but Edgar then, under hypnosis, would tell them where in the United States the remedy was. Even sometimes, and there's one about a, a, a product called oil of smoke, which no one had heard of oil of smoke, and they asked Edgar, where is it? And he told them it was in a pharmacy in a city. Well, they telegraphed the pharmacy in the city, and the pharmacist telegraphed back, there is no such thing here. And they asked Edgar, and he said, tell him to look in at this particular shelf behind these bottles. Well, the pharmacist had oh, wow. only bought the pharmacy a few years before, and he went back. He did exactly what Edgar said, and he found it there. So other people got interested in having Casey look for gold and oil. The oil readings are very famous. Uh, Edgar himself spent a lot of time in Texas uh, in oil fields based on the readings. Uh, the whole idea of Atlantis actually popped up in this because of gold readings. Uh, there was a group in Florida that, were, that was trying to develop the islands of Bimini for a resort, and they were hoping there was gas and oil under the islands that they could get and, of course, make money. And in mm-hmm. that reading, uh, and that reading was in 1926, uh, Edgar simply gave a clue, and he said, oh, this is, was the highest portion of once a great continent. And they simply ignored him and that statement and asked him what was there, and he talked about gold there. He said there were 120,000 gold coins. Um, there's a story I can tell about that later, about gold coins found at Bimini, jars of them. Um, then later they began asking him more questions about the Bimini area, and that's when uh, all of his statements about Atlantis started appearing. So Casey gave 14,300 and some what are called documented readings, where every word he said in the readings was written down so it could be tested later. That's what really makes him different from other psychics. It's all written down. And out of those 14,000 readings, 700 of them had something in them about Atlantis. And so that's where all that information comes from in the book, which you were so kind about in the beginning of the show, giving a description of it. Uh, It comes from those 700 readings that Edgar Cayce gave. 
So that's kind of a thumbnail that gets us up to how he told the, uh, the story of Atlantis. Some of it came from uh, what are called life readings, where individuals would go in and Casey would tell them about the influences that they had from past lives. And yes, Casey did believe in reincarnation. Uh, he did mm-hmm. not like that at first, and initially it caused them to quit doing the readings for a brief time because they were fundamentalist Christians, and it kind of scared them. Uh, and, but they they decided that they had hurt no one and that everybody who had had a reading just talked about how much it had helped them. So they decided we'll keep doing the readings unless anyone is ever hurt, and then we'll stop. So they didn't stop until Edgar died in 1945. I well, guess I went all the, over the place there, but I'm trying to give a background to Casey here. Well, no, he's, you know, it, it's funny because I have a group of people I work with, and when I mentioned the book and talked about Edgar Casey, one of the women said, well, now I know that name, but I'm not sure from where, and I looked at her and I said, how could you be in this field and not know Edgar Casey? <laughs> um, it just, it blows my mind. She knows about him now. Um, yeah. But but it it I think the book, in many ways, gives a, a better explanation of of Atlantis than I've than I've read anywhere else. To be honest with you, because it does talk about its size. It talks about how how people came to be Atlanteans, how how the population of Atlantis Atlantis. Um, were spirits and and how they came into being and and their evolution. I mean, it we're talking about a, a continent that was um, theoretically there for how many thousands of years? Well, the, Casey said that it was there for two hundred. That it started that the first people came into Atlantis roughly two hundred and ten thousand BC. So they'd be two hundred twelve thousand okay. years ago. Which is a long okay. time. Uh, oh, yeah. And it, yeah, that's a long time ago. And, you know, there's never been any human remains that old. In fact, if scientists find anything that's 7,000 years old, uh, human skeletal remains, it, it's, a, it's amazing. They don't find many that are that old, even under good conditions. No. So uh, but, it, but it's just, obvious you know, to me why <laughs> there's not a lot of evidence of it. But go ahead. Sorry. Oh, yeah. No, no I, I, I think that what I would like to do is, is kind of take, be, because of the way he explained how people came to be on the continent, um, the fact that they, they, they were in spirit form and they decided to take um, physical form yes. and the evolution of that physical form. I think that's a fascinating story. Can you kind of go into that a little bit? Sure. And uh, the last time I was on your show, I spoke about um, Native American beliefs and the path of souls. And what yep. is just amazing to me is their beliefs about how spirit in really inhabits everything uh, is so mm-hmm. similar to what Casey said. But let's stick with Casey here. Okay, so... Okay. Casey Casey believed in what he would call an involution, and an involution was uh, consciousness, spiritual energy, or energy beings that have no form per se, no three-dimensional form as we know it, that push or project themselves into physical matter in order to experience what it's like being physical matter. Mm-hmm. So, and the term godlings is sometimes used because all of these spiritual energy beings uh, are pieces of the whole. The whole being God or the whole spiritual world, and we're all pieces of that. So, in the beginning, these little pieces of energy that were individual beings, in a sense, pushed or projected themselves into physical matter. And long ago, some 10 million years ago and before, they pushed themselves into various animals that were here, some lower forms of life that were here. Uh, Some of them pushed, Casey even said some of them pushed themselves into minerals to see what it was like to be certain kinds of minerals and physical objects. 
Uh, but uh, they they first got into bodies of their own around 10 million years ago, and they were very primitive. And so that would be the first root race. Then uh, later, these godlings pushed themselves into an, a much more advanced form of human. And this advanced form of human was um, more physical. And think of it, it's, it's a three-dimensional physicality, but the problem was the, the spiritual energy got trapped in the physical body. And the more that the, that the spiritual energy inhabits, the spiritual consciousness inhabits physicality, the greater the odds are it becomes trapped. And it becomes trapped for a number of reasons. One is is that we can experience our, our five senses, and the truth is there's probably more than just five senses, uh, but we experience the five senses here. Atlantis started around 210,000 B.C., and there were two beings um, that came into existence then in an advanced human, and it was actually a plan by these godling spiritual energy forces to extricate any beings, any of these energy beings that wanted out of the earth, that wanted to get out and back to the whole, to go back to the cosmic consciousness. And then... Uh, so Atlantis really started in 210,000 B.C. In 110,000 B.C., these human, human-like forms became male and female. So Casey says that between 210 and 100, roughly 110,000 B.C., we were androgynous. We were both sexes in one, and it was around 110,000 years ago that we became two sexes, and that's his story of Amelius who would be considered Adam and Lilith. Uh, Lilith is a creature <laughs> that is in Jewish mysticism and Hebrew mis- mysticism. Uh, but that's when the gender split occurred, and Amelius and Lilith ruled Atlantis and really helped the people become much more spiritual until sometime around 50,000 B.C., before 50,000 B.C., when Another fellow Casey mentions uh, sort of takes over. His name was Esai, E-S-A-I. Casey gave, gave a lot of readings about this guy. And the population then split into two groups. One group was called the Children of the Law of One who retained a connection to the spiritual world. They realized that they were part of the whole and they were all one. The other part he called the sons of Belial, B-E-L-I-A-L. And the sons of Belial were seeking gratification of all the physical senses, power over others, um, sexual gratification, uh, and really they loved pleasure. That's, That's the bottom line. So you had these two groups, and the sons of Belial became warlike, and they began to dominate others. The children of the law of one, some of them stayed stayed in Atlantis and attempted politically to um, temper down the influence of the sons of Belial, but others of them fled to other parts of the world where they mixed in with the populations that were indigenous in these other parts of the world. And then in 50,000, he get, Casey gives an exact date here, 50,722 B.C., uh, there was a, that was called the first destruction of Atlantis, and it had to do with um, large animals that began roaming all over the world and were causing mass destruction with people. Uh, these would be uh, like saber-toothed tigers and giant sloth. Uh, um, mastodons and loads of other huge animals that that were really so a lot of them were extinct even before uh, 10,000 BC and the end of the last ice age. So the people became more and more encased in physical matter. We got trapped 
uh, more and more to the extent to where we had to be here many, many different lifetimes to learn certain lessons to get out. Now, that's that's what Casey says. Uh, if you ask me if I believe all that, I would tell you very honestly, no, I don't believe any of it. But if you ask me if I disbelieve it, I would tell you, no, I don't disbelieve any of it either. I honestly don't know. I find it very, very interesting. I find that a lot of this makes really good sense. It explains things. It's very similar to the uh, theosophical ideas. There are a lot of religions and religious spiritual systems that tell us we are spiritual beings trapped in a physical body uh, and that we have to learn certain lessons to escape this trap in the physical body. So Casey's in line with that. Uh, but the story of Atlantis is really about all of that, and I've I've, I've taken the story up to roughly 50,000 B.C. Plato, now, on the other that, hand... Now, what was that destruction, though? You said it was the well, first the, destruction. Well, the, the first destruction, there was a group of leaders from around the world that were called together. They They were called together in Egypt, and they came as far away as Tibet. Some came from the main islands of Atlantis. Uh, they traveled, some of them traveled by air. And when I say by air, immediately people think of jet planes or uh, something, some kind of aircraft. But Casey was very specific in his descriptions of these. And they are a lot like primitive uh, hot air dirigibles or blimps. And we can we can mm-hmm. discuss that later. But anyway, this group got together and they had to come up with a way to eliminate or move the animals. Atlantis had developed, the sons of Belial in particular, had taken these the crystals. Let's get into the crystals. Uh, they had taken the crystals, in particular one very large one, which was initially called the white stone because it was a, a, a huge quartz crystal. And it was initially used by the children of the Law of One to communicate with what they called the spiritual divine realm. And a group, a a priestess would gather a group around this crystal. They would perform a ceremony. And from out of the crystal, messages would be beamed into the priestess who would then uh, recite the messages to everyone else. So that was how that was how the crystal was initially used when it was the white stone. It then evolved into what is called the Tui stone. Uh, it was cut into it was polished and cut into some facets. Uh, it was still used for communication to these other realms, but they then realized it could be used to focus beams of light and energy. And by the time this meeting was held in 50,000 B.C., they had developed a way to really focus the light from these crystals, which now they had more than one. And they decided that they would use those to ignite – and Casey's real specific about this too – to ignite pockets of methane gas that were under the Sargasso Sea. Now remember – I haven't told you where Casey said Atlantis was. It's from basically the Gulf of Mexico over to Gibraltar, where at the mouth of the Mediterranean, that it was an island empire that strung across the Atlantic. Plato, on the other hand, said it was an island empire that began at the mouth of Gibraltar, and you could hop island and island over to the opposite continent. And people think Mm -hmm. of small islands. Well, Plato's Atlantis, the main island, was 340 miles by 221 miles. So that is an area the size of Cuba approximately, or what the Great Bahama Bank was uh, during the last ice age when when most of it was exposed. But anyway, uh, these large animals in that area, they, they needed to get rid of. So exactly how they were going to do it, who knows? Uh, Casey wasn't specific about it, but something went wrong, and they ignited and released, uh, created earthquakes, and it released a lot of methane pockets in the Sargasso, which begins basically in the Bahamas and goes out about halfway across the Atlantic Ocean. That is what's called the Sargasso Sea. Interestingly, not too many years ago, geologists discovered enormous 
pockets of methane gas that had burst in that area thousands of years ago. Enormous quantities of methane gas were released, and they think it was from earthquakes. Uh, that's okay. something I don't think I've ever said before, and I don't think uh, in that Edgar Casey's Atlantis book we didn't put it in it because at the time they hadn't discovered all these. Uh, so that yeah. discovery kind of validates one part of it because when I first heard that, I knew that in the Bermuda Triangle the methane gas was one of the theories of, of planes that would crash. The methane would burst, right. and then a plane flying over would <laughs> stop. The engines would stop. Uh, but anyway... Uh, so they did this, and that caused, when they when they released the methane, caused explosions and earthquakes, and it broke Atlantis into five big islands. That's what, and and a number of small ones, but they recovered themselves. That was in 50,000 BC, and they built themselves up even more technologically advanced up until 28,000 BC, and that was the age. At 28,000 B.C., Atlantis appears to have reached its highest technological development, according to Casey. Uh, they had uh, these crystals set up that would beam light beams from one to another. They used these light beams to communicate with the airships and with each other. They used the light beams to create heat that ran these massive wheels and multi, multi-cogged multi gears that ran equipment all over the place. Most of what Casey described was very agrarian, that there were people that raised food. He didn't talk about them using tractors or anything like that. Uh, both Casey and, and uh, Plato mentioned horses. Plato mentioned elephants uh, that were there, which, of course, mastodons, and woolly mammoths, which are elephants, were all over the Americas at the time. And in the Bahamas, in fact, the very first mastodon evidence was found by Charles Darwin in the Bahamas, which is which is strange. It's the very first evidence of them. Um, so that takes us to 28,000 B.C. Atlantis had really reached a very high pinnacle, uh, but by that time, this sort of... Uh, battle, be- I call it a battle, but it's more of a political battle for influence between the children of the Law of One and the Sons of Belial had taken a very bad turn, and a whole lot of Atlanteans fled and went to South America and to Central America and to North America. A lot of them went to Egypt and the Gobi. Some of them went to the Pyrenees Mountains, between, uh, which is in Iberia, between Spain and France. Um, so that, that is the second destruction. The second destruction occurred, it broke Atlantis into three big islands. Uh, according to Casey, in 28,000 B.C., that is when the great flood in the Bible took place, uh, Noah's Flood. Uh, and that is his his story of that. Uh, the fourth root race occurred sometime before that, and the fourth root race. This is this is something I really need to, to mention. It's when so it, it's around 50,000 BC before this first destruction. Uh, the Atlanteans decided, and this this was predominantly the influence of the children of the Law of One that they needed to send out groups of people and and try to uh, incarnate in different ways that would suit the needs of individuals. So they created five different groups of people. And those groups of people were a brown race. A, uh, the brown race was was initially in South America, they created a yellow race, which was initially in the Gobi, a white race that was initially in the Altai and Caucasus Mountains. Um, brown, red, yellow, what have I missed other than red? Red, I was going to say last. The red race were the, yes, the blacks were the Nubians. Uh, that's where they were placed. And the red race were the Atlanteans. Edgar Casey said repeatedly the Atlanteans were a red 
race. Now, I know a lot of people have written that Casey said that the Atlanteans were the whites, but that is not true. It's nowhere in Casey's readings. He even said that the Atlanteans that left, like in 28,000 B.C. and again right before 10,000 B.C., that a lot of them went to the northeast of America. And they settled in the land that we come to call the Iroquois land, and they became the chiefs and the elite of the Iroquois tribes, that the Iroquois have their roots and their origins from Atlantis, which is why you're in, I know you are interested in the uh, mitochondrial DNA analysis, haplogroup X, which yes. is found very heavily <laughs> in the Northeast, where Edgar Casey said the Atlanteans went and everywhere else. Now, we'll get there, uh, but Casey said the Atlanteans were the red race. The final destruction of Atlantis occurred in 10,000 B.C., according to Casey. That is very much in line with Plato. Plato said it was 9,600 B.C., approximately. Uh, they both said that it happened rather quickly. Both of them uh, gave hints about how it happened, that it was something from the sky that came down. Um, Plato, Plato's readings said that uh, – they weren't readings. Plato's Critias and Timaeus talked about Atlantis, and Plato made it very clear that the Earth has had many civilizations in the past – that are routinely and periodically destroyed from heavenly bodies movements, which is astonishing that Plato would write that in 355 B.C. before anybody even thought about meteorites striking the earth or comets hitting. Uh, Casey said that it was an act of God that destroyed the Atlanteans, um, but it really appears that it was something coming from the sky because it caused a... Uh, a pole shift, uh, it caused tsunamis uh, and massive destruction fire. And that all of that boils down to what looks like either a comet strike or a meteor strike. And, of course, there's evidence of a comet striking Earth around that time. It's called, it caused the Younger Dryas event. Um, and, of course, that gets into the science. And I'd rather just stick uh -huh. with Casey as much as I can here. So that's okay. pretty much Casey's story of Atlantis. Before 10,000 B.C., the Atlanteans, uh, the priestesses and some of the priests uh, were still very spiritually attuned. There are some alien or UFO-like uh, things in this. Uh, not a lot, but there are some in Casey's readings, and one of those is that they received messages from other worlds and the outer spheres that that this final destruction was going to occur. And they got these messages roughly 400 years before it occurred, and they devised a plan uh, to make records and repositories of all the information of Atlantis, including its history, the use of these crystals, which came to be known as the firestone, at the very end it was called a firestone because it would it could burst things on fire. Um, so they came up with this plan and they decided that they would make three identical record halls or halls of records. One of them, the the most the best known, the most famous, uh, was going to be placed in Egypt. Uh, and this was roughly 10,500 B.C. when it was done, and uh, a priest went from the remaining islands of Atlantis to Egypt with these records and, and placed them uh, in a chamber under near the right paw of the Sphinx. Uh, there's a tunnel system there, supposedly. And they sealed that, and the pyramid was built at the same time, according to Casey. The second Hall of Records, uh, which is probably the second most famous, is the one near Bimini. He said that there was a temple uh, of the Poseidians near Bimini. It was very specific about that. Uh, and he said that in 1926 and in 1927. Um, and he actually said if you do a survey uh, down the Gulf Stream at Bimini, you'll be able to find remnants of this, and that's basically what my wife and I started doing. 
Uh, and then the third one, which we didn't even know about until uh, it was approximately 1998 when we found out about it. The third one is in the Yucatan, and it is at a site, a uh, Maya site known as Piedras Negras in Guatemala. It is on the Asuma Cinta River. Uh, and right on the other side of the Asuma Cinta is Mexico. It is very remote, very difficult to get to. Uh, and my wife and I have been there, as well as all over in the uh, Bahamas, searching. Uh, and those three Hall of Records are identical. Casey was pretty specific as to what they contained. Uh, he gave uh, numbers, uh, 32 stone tablets. He talked about linens, certain weapons that they had. Uh, the stone tablets contained the history of Atlantis uh, and other details. Exactly what all those are, we do not know. It's assumed that the three tablets are written in the same language, uh, although no one knows. He said that they would be found and uncovered. Uh, he said that it would occur when the time was ready, and he actually said it would probably occur sometime in the beginning of the 21st century, which is pretty much where we are right now. So mm -hmm. that's a that's kind of a thumbnail summary. I don't think I've ever talked that long and given that summary, but um, <laughs> um, yeah, there you go. <laughs> well, a <clears throat> number of things you know stand out here. First of all, you mentioned it briefly, and one of the things that um, fascinated me was, and, and I'm not going to go into detail with the mitochondrial, but yes. the fact that haploid group haploid group X has been determined to to represent those who may come from Atlantean descent. Yes. And and <clears throat> that sounds now, really mainstream technical. scientists, mainstream archaeologists would not agree with that. Mainstream archaeologists say, Oh no, 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 that you're just guessing. But go ahead, sorry. Well, of course they would, but you know yes. scientists take take, you know, many generations to admit to the truth. Exactly. So that this is only the first decade that this has been brought out means yep. that we've got a couple hundred years before they're going to admit to it. <laughs> but for for anybody that is curious and has done the 23andMe, they will give you your haploid group um, when you do the, the um, genetic testing. And yes. And I have to admit, I hit that in the book, Bookmark went in, and I went right to the computer to find out what haploid group my genetics were in. Unhappily, yeah. they are not X. But, well, but, mine know. isn't either. I tested mine <laughs> also, and it's, it's not X. I am part Native American, but not a very big part. Uh, I'm proud. Uh -huh. to, it's probably my best part, but uh, I'm, I'm, I'm okay with that. Uh, but there aren't a lot of haploid group X. It's... Um, and, you know, when Casey's story of Atlantis, most Atlanteans were killed. And remember, these haplogroups only are – it's the female lineage. It's only the female side. So it eliminates half the population right there. Uh, and uh -huh. if you lose if you lose 90% um, of your population, of course, you're not going to have as many descendants left. And the Atlanteans lost most of their population. Uh, and then certain, you know, lines, families die out. Uh, they don't always go on. So well, yeah, but go ahead. But but when you look at where haploid groups, group X's are, they are basically in the areas that that Casey said the Atlanteans um, migrated to. Yeah, I'll go one step further. They are only in the areas <laughs> where Casey said they migrated. And that is astonishing if you think about it. It's just absolutely astonishing. They are only where Casey said they went. And that is around the Mediterranean, uh, in the Pyrenees Mountains, in North America, very heavily uh, in North America, in the burial mounds. We're talking about not just living people here. We're talking about yeah. the dead. Uh, burial mounds in America and Native American remains have been heavily tested for mitochondrial DNA, which is what we're talking about. And haplogroup X is found in about 40% of most of the oldest mounds in Northeast America. Now, as the mounds are more and more recent, 
the amount of haplogroup X declined rather precipitously, but the oldest ones have huge amounts of haplogroup X in. And X is literally, it was designated X, because there's A, B, C, D, there's an E, F, G, H, I, J, K. There are roughly 42 different types of these. Haplogroup X was the fifth one found, but when it was found, it was so unusual and they had no idea where it came from or what it was. They called it X as in unknown, not even knowing mm -hmm. they were going to find enough to fill out the entire alphabet, plus come up with sub ones like there's A, there's A1, there's A2, there's A3, there's A1B, A1A, A1C. So there's all these little sub -mute. These are all mutational lines. So haplogroup X is only found where Casey said it was. Uh, it's been mm -hmm. pulled out of, of burials in the Andes Mountains where Casey said Atlanteans went in 10,000 B.C. in the Andes. It has been found in Florida peat bogs, which is a place Casey said Atlanteans went in North America. It's been found heavily in North America and, like I say, all these other places around the world. It's everywhere Casey said it was. And it's not really found in places where Casey didn't mention that Atlanteans went to. Uh, there is a group. And, and, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say, for those of you that are, you know, looking wildly now for your 23andMe report, you know, being of Atlantean descent genetically, can, can, you've got a 50-50 chance of being one of the good guys. So, yeah, there you go. But you got a 50-50 chance of being one of the bad guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or you could still be here because you have to atone for what you did one Absolutely. way or another. It just, but I think it, we choose. It, I think we can choose. That's, that's my, my profession and all. I think we choose um, the, the direction we're going to go. I think we all choose that along the way. But that's oh, another story. I'm, I'm sure. I'm yeah. sure, but but you know, it, it it was something that immediately I could test and you know, and did, and then came back and read the rest of the book. But but it just to me, the the it makes all of this makes so much more sense to me, and especially with the migrations of where they went, because in so many places there are some of these architectural sites that 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 had to take. A, a, a greater amount of skill and 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 talent to create them. If you if you go into the South Americans, Teotihuacan, and all of those, I mean, these are sites that that took mastery to do. And, oh yeah. And you know, when you look at all of the places where these sites happen to be, you find that they are areas that that is, have been designated that the Atlanteans did go to. So. To me, it says, okay, they had – my original theory was that, that Atlantis wasn't an island. It was a mothership, that it broke down and it landed in the middle of the ocean and it terraformed. And while they were trying to figure out how to fix it so they could go home, they, they set up a, a community uh, you know, or whatever, and, and they were there for thousands and thousands of years. And – they sent people out as emissaries to all cultures that, that, that they thought were viable. And at some point they found the piece they needed to fix their engine and they took off and they went home and they left all of their ambassadors in these different areas, which that explained how all of the things got, got built. It's a great I like story. I like my mother ship story. Well, I like Atlantis. Yeah, it's better. a great story. <laughs> It, it still could be Atlantis. <laughs> well, it, but, it could be. I mean, the truth is, um, you know, I, I, I started out, I, I didn't start out, but I, I said about halfway in that if you'd ask me, Greg, do you believe this, I would say no. And then if you'd say, Greg, do you disbelieve this, I would say no. Uh, I am very, very open to following the facts where they go. That's why mm -hmm. I was initially asked by the Casey organization. I mean, people think, oh, they just want somebody to verify and validate Agar Casey for whatever their reasons are, uh, to get members or whatever. Uh, and they asked me because they knew that I was uh, – I'm, I'm a scientist by training. I've published loads and loads of peer-reviewed articles in major psychology journals and in criminal justice 
Uh, and if something is nonsense, I'm willing to say, look, it's nonsense. There's not a, not a shred of evidence of any of this. So with Casey's uh-huh. story about – with Casey, so they asked me to do it, knowing that if it was total nonsense, I would tell them it's total nonsense. Uh, now, I don't know about this, you know, the, the spiritual stuff. I have my own spiritual beliefs and so on. I, I seldom, if ever, talk about them. But Casey's story about us being godlings and pushing into physical matter and all that, it's really interesting to me. I really like the idea. But do I believe it? No. Do I disbelieve it? No. I don't know. I find it mm-hmm. very, very interesting, and it explains a great deal. But I can look at the dates Casey gave for certain events. I can look at what the archaeological evidence says. I can, for example, look at all the places Casey said the Atlanteans went, and then I can match it up with what's known genetically about all the ancient remains that have been pulled out of those places. And that's what we've done. And all the places that Casey said the Atlanteans went are the places where haplogroup X is. I mean, it's really that... And I, I... does that mean they're Atlanteans? No, but it sure in 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 science you would say we have uh, validated that this is a hypothesis. It's a pretty darn good hypothesis that has strong evidence in support of it. Is it absolute proof? No, but we sure have a lot of very strong evidence that this story is true. And I do believe well, there is a lost civilization. I've said many times, I don't care what you call it, for lack of a better term, Atlantis works. It was in the Uh Atlantic Ocean. Plato said it was. There are loads of ancient Greek philosophers and writers and others from other countries who said that there is something over the ocean. Plato wasn't the only one that said it. So we know. And he he didn't finish his work either. I mean, he 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 wrote two, two parts and there was a third to come. He did. That's correct, and he he died. Uh, so yeah. we, we just we don't know. And while uh, some people say that oh, Plato's story of Atlantis was an allegory of moral moral laws to teach the Greeks because they were falling into debauchery or whatever, uh, that there's really no evidence that that's the truth either. There are people who do not want Atlantis to have existed. Um, for whatever reasons, uh, and I could, uh, as a psychologist, I could say what I see some of their deep psychological reasons are. Uh, I can see why uh, a lot of the skeptics don't like the idea of giants in the past. A lot of these people hate anything that supports the Bible. A lot of them hate anything that supports skept- uh, that supports psychics. They don't want any psychics to be accurate. They don't want any senses other than the five. They don't want to believe that anyone has access to information other than through the five senses uh, for their own reasons. Uh, I think it's actually – go ahead. As far as the third destruction, um, in your book, didn't you say that that there was a a comet hit or – Fragments yes, of a there comet is great. Casey based- didn't say that, but yes, there was a comet that it, in the United States uh, it was yeah. known as, as the uh, Carolina Bays event. Uh, the evidence yeah. of those, which we have been to some of the Carolina Bays, along with uh, Andrew Collins, as a matter of fact, went with us. Uh, there's good evidence of that. There's good evidence around the world that there were massive fires and what would – what we would refer to as a nuclear winter. When this comet struck, it caused so much debris and dust and soot from the fires to be thrown into the atmosphere, it blocked the sun and caused a winter. And in that winter, sunlight did not hit the earth, and a lot of the plants and animals then died. And all of I mean, this has always been a mystery. How did the megafauna all disappear right around 9600 B.C. Now, for years, archaeologists said that, oh, that the Clovis people or the hunter-gatherers at that time simply killed them all and ate them. But there's really <laughs> no, no evidence of that. Uh, the evidence is they died rather suddenly over the period of a year or so. 
uh, and they disappeared. And then the Clovis culture disappeared. And the reason is Clovis was a huge – Clovis is known as a huge uh, stone point at the end of a spear used to kill something like a mastodon or a woolly mammoth. Well, when there are no mastodons and woolly mammoths, that huge spear no longer is a viable and functional weapon. It can't be used on people because simply it's too big. So they simply discarded it and no longer used it. The idea of all these uh, all these uh, megafauna, which are large animals, disappearing at once, explains why the Clovis culture went away. It's also explained by this comet striking the world, and it, it, they believe it struck in around the Canada or in the Atlantic Ocean. No one's exactly sure, but evidence of it has been found all around the world in what's called the Oscilla horizon, which is a thin layer of black diamonds. They're micro diamonds caused by heat heat and explosions, almost like nuclear explosions, and soot that settled on the surface of the earth. Uh, and it's, it's everywhere around the world. So we know it happened. It happened right around 10,000 B.C. or roughly 9,800 B.C., all in the time frame of the destruction of Atlantis. And it explains a lot of things. It, it simply does. So I believe in that. Andrew Collins does. Actually, a lot of those details are in a book Andrew and I have coming out, which we co-authored, and that will be out in September, and it's called Denisovan Origins. But maybe we'll be on in September to talk about that. Oh, you bet you will be. <laughs> so <clears throat> now that we've destroyed Atlantis, <laughs> okay, you and your wife have taken on one of the greatest adventures of all time, I think. Well, and it was an adventure. That's true. It still is. Um, it still because is because you you had you had discerned that the major um, part of Atlantis um, is is around yet today. Well, yes. Um, really, the how we got how we started going. We we made 25 week long trips into the Bahamas. That's that's where we are today. 25 week long trips, all on boats. Uh, we flew in several times. We did a lot of aerial surveys. Uh, the first survey we flew into Cuban airspace, and we flew at 500 feet to stay under Cuban radar uh, to find some things. But really, the the genesis of this whole thing happened because of Andrew Collins. When I met this guy from Britain, Andrew Collins is an author from Britain, very well known. He's on Ancient Aliens almost every episode now. Uh, Andrew wrote a book called Gateway to Atlantis. I got him to come to the United States and give a talk at the ARE. During his talk at the Casey organization, he showed a picture that I had seen before but kind of forgotten about of a formation in the Bahamas that was found in 1968 from the air by two pilots and it had never been <coughs> excuse me never been visited by anyone and it was said to be a massive triple ringed stone circle in shallow water in the Bahamas and mm-hmm. i had i then i got real interested in it and asked him more details he told me to contact the guy which i did the guy said that he had Uh, a film of it, and in his film he showed the same picture and he simply moved the camera across of it, and that's the film of the formation. But he said, no, he'd never been there. I talked to an archaeologist uh, who who had worked with the ARE, who had tried to find it, and they spent roughly $30,000 flying around in the Bahamas and around Andros trying to find it up and down. Andros is a huge island. It's the largest of the Bahama Islands. It's 140 miles long and 30 miles wide. But they were unable to find it. So I, uh, this was in 2003. And I was at the point where I said, look, uh, we're, really he- we're really healthy. And I said, I, I want to go find this thing. And there was another one, another structure called Rebikoff's E, named for Dmitry Rebikoff, who was a French... Uh, marine biologist who had done some of the initial work at Bimini, and he had found this formation that looks like the cursive letter E, A, B, C, D, E, 
on the bottom in shallow water in the Bahamas, but nobody had been able to find it on the water. So there's this E formation that they thought was a building, and the, there was this circular formation somewhere down there that uh, looked like a triple ring of standing stones. So we began this, which is very odd, by going to Miami, Florida, finding the pilot that actually took the photograph, went to his house. He said no one had ever done that before or asked him about it. He said he knew it had become well-known and that people tried to find it, but nobody ever came and interviewed him. So we interviewed him, and the interview was on a film that's available on YouTube. I actually posted that film on uh, Facebook this evening. Oh, good. And he pulled – I am ai have a private pilot's license. So he pulled out his uh, log, and he pulled out a map. And I said, do you know where, he, where it is? And he said, yeah, it's right here. And he pointed to where it was on this map. Now, it's actually in the Bahamas. It is at the s- extreme southern end of Andros Island, which is actually – in the Havana, Cuba, ADZ, which is their air defense zone. Uh, And that's why commercial flights don't go over there, and there are other uh, planes you just don't go in there. So I then found a uh, a charter plane, a a two-engine, what's called a Norman Islander, which is a very specialized aircraft, Uh, at the private airport in Miami and chartered this plane. We subsequently flew down there, and we flew at 500 feet. We took GPS from the air. We found Ribikoff's E first, that E-shaped formation, got its GPS, which was in North Andros, uh, in the water, and then we flew south, and we started finding lots and lots of circular formations and dots and other things in the water, which we didn't know what they were. So we would take the GPS from the air. We finally found a a massive circle, which this guy, this pilot, his name was Trig Adams, who took the picture, told us, well, actually, there were two circles down there. And he said, we never got a picture of the second one. So we found the the, the second one that they didn't get a picture of from the air and uh, got its GPS and got photographs of it, and then we found this triple ring of stones, supposedly, from the air. Uh, We then landed, and it was very – people just don't understand this. It's the logistics. It was very difficult to find any way to get over there and look at these things. That's why nobody does it. Uh, It sounds easy, but this is in an area that is totally remote – There is no Coast Guard. There are no Bahamas Defense Forces there. There are no other boats. You don't see airplanes. There are no ships. There's nothing. In fact, uh, satellite radios don't work there. They're blocked, so you don't even have that. You can use a marine radio, but a marine radio only goes about 15 to 20 miles. So you're really very much on your own, and it's very shallow water. So we wound up getting a Bahamian – we found a Bahamian – sponge fishermen and they're actually sponge divers but he had a little small boat and this was the first thing we did we showed him where it was uh we asked him how much he would charge us to take us he told us and i told him this is something we did the entire time uh all of our trips were self-funded by the way one of the skeptics said oh the are paid for all this and they didn't pay a penny of it we paid it but i told the guy that's not enough i'll, I'll pay you twice that and that's what we've done consistently. We've always overpaid, and it, it it has actually worked out really well because they like us. They um, they love it when we come in. They always have information for us. They tell us about things that are found there that otherwise they wouldn't tell you. So this guy wow. got us over. It was a long trip. Several. It's very shallow. Some places, the water's a foot deep. It's only a foot to get over there. It's roughly a 60-mile trip. You've got to cut through the middle of Andros to get there. Uh, Andros has these bites. They're called bites, uh, which is almost – sort of looks like a river from the air, but they're very small. They're very shallow. They move around. They have high tide and low tide, and low tide, they can just disappear. But anyway, we went through those. We had to stop several times, and he had to suck the sand 
that got in his motor out, which I learned a, a lot about uh, boat motors on that, which he had no backup motor, uh, and uh, there's nobody there. I mean, it really is remote. Eventually, uh, we got to the first circle, and it was a massive, perfect circle, about 250 feet in diameter, pure white in the center, uh, surrounded by a perfect edge of seaweed and sponge on the bottom. And then we went further, and we got to the second circle of the standing, so-called standing stones. And it wasn't quite low tide at the time, but you could see these sticking out of the water. And we went right up to them. Uh, this is on the film, too, where my wife and I are standing by one. Uh, and they look like stones, but they are giant sponge. I'm, I'm letting that sink in. Sponge. Giant sponge. Some of them are three, four, five feet high. They are black. Uh, they grow straight up. Uh, when they're out of the water, they look like stones, even when you walk up to them. So the question is, well, why would they grow in this in this perfect circular formation? Well, in the center of this formation, we actually found the explanation in a biology, a marine biology textbook while we were in the Bahamas on that trip. I went and found this textbook to figure it out. Um, but this perfect circle formed by a coral reef, a circular coral reef, and then fish, uh, as, as it's explained in the textbooks, you get uh, lobsters and bottom dwellers that live in the reef and start pushing things out. Turtles are also there. So they will push things out and sand and debris into a circle. And then you get fish that begin swimming around and around the reef. And then you get bigger fish swimming around and around in the reef. And you can actually see this process going on, and they create this perfect circle. <laughs> so we were disappointed, obviously, but at the same time, it's like this mystery was written up in Charles Berlitz's books from the 70s. It's been a mystery since then, and we just solved it. No one else has ever been able to find this and solve it. So we felt good about it. We took another. Uh, we had to take another trip back. We eventually got to Ribikoff's E, this E-shaped formation. Same thing. It was a very odd coral reef that had uh, what what you can call seaweed. It's not really seaweed, but it looks like it. That is growing up in a in just this rock, and it makes what looks like the letter E from the air. So we thought we'd solved it, and then a guy told us. That night when we were getting ready to fly back to the States, and I had no intention of going back to the Bahamas doing this anymore. I figured, okay, both these mysteries turned out to be natural. And then this guy came, a dive operator. He thought we were treasure seekers, as everybody did, because everybody's looking for treasure down there. They want gold. We had no interest in that. He finally realized when I pulled out all the materials we had that we were for real. We were really looking for archaeological sites. So he said, okay, there is a site out here, and he told me where it was. He said, it looks a lot like the Bimini Road, but it's bigger. And I said, really? And he said, yeah, and I was very skeptical. And I said, well, how do I get to it? And he told me. And I told him, well, we're supposed to fly out the next morning. I believe it was like 11 o'clock we were supposed to fly out. So my wife and I lugged our gear up to this area of the coast. And this was really stupid as I think about it now. But I swam <laughs> out roughly 400 yards into what's called the tongue of the ocean. Uh, it was very shallow at first, and then I went out further and further, came back in and told her I can't find anything. And so I moved a little bit, and I swam out, and darn if there wasn't this really bizarre rock formation out there of giant blocks, some of which were sitting on top of each other, and it looked very clearly like it was man-made. 
and that is what hooked us. That was the morning we were supposed to leave. I got three photos of it. I thought I had, I had underwater cameras that actually had film in them at the time. And I thought I, I took a whole bunch of pictures, but I had run out, and I didn't know it. Um, and we decided to go back, but we also decided we needed to look at the Bimini Road. We had to compare this formation at Andros, which became known as the Andros Platform. Uh, we put a press release out on it, and it got a huge amount of attention. Uh, we were contacted by numerous geologists uh, and some archaeologists, but the geologists were just fascinated with it. Uh, the Andros platform looks sort of like the Bimini Road, but is a triple row of curving stones that are very clearly man-made that enclose a harbor, and it's very clear that this is a... Uh, what would be called a key, spelled Q-U-A-Y, which is like a breakwater for an ancient harbor. Uh, it's about 15 feet underwater, but there's three different tiers in this thing, three different rows, uh, and it's got a, an, an opening through it, and it's got a kind of a, a platform that goes up to it, and it's very clear that it's it's quite ancient. So that got us then to go to Bimini and get involved. But we weren't going to do it. So really, it was all kind of accidental that we started doing <laughs> Bimini. <laughs> well, in, in your travels, you also had what I consider, and it's just me, it's, you know, I speak only for myself, what I would call a spiritual uh, experience with um, a gentleman named Samuel Rollo. Oh, yes. Yeah, Mr. Rollo. Um, yeah, you, you tell us about him. Well, Mr. Rowe was he actually, on Andros. He was, was on Andros, Andros Island. He was 94 years old, which is what my dad is this week. My my father turns 94 this week. Wow. Um, Mr. Rowe, um while we were awaiting, actually to get to Ribikoff's E, the first trip we were there, we didn't make it. Like I said, we had to go back to get to Ribikoff's E. So we we actually arranged a seaplane to pick us up and take us over to the other side of Andros to look for Ribikoff's E. Uh, and the seaplane came, we got in it, and I showed the guy where we wanted to go, and he said, oh, no, I can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> so we had a day to kill, and during that day, this the people in this place we were staying told us, oh, there's these caves up here you might want to see, and there's this... This guy that that really tells some stories. He's he goes to the Christian church. He's Catholic, but he believes in reincarnation and he talks about all this stuff. So we went up to this place. There's a lot of the film of him on our in our videos. Uh, this was cold. He didn't. He had no phone. He didn't know we were coming up. We walked up and this hill. Uh, and it's jungle, so it's jungle on both sides and a little path going up this hill. And when I say a hill, we're talking about uh, limestone um, karst, actually, which is kind of uh, very badly withered limestone. So it's very rugged. But as we went up the hill, we started seeing fruit of all different kinds. There were orange trees. Uh, there's a lot of coconut trees there, and there were some banana trees. Uh, pineapple trees, uh, peach, pear, you name it. Everything was there when we were walking up this hill. And and then there was this uh, very thin, very well-dressed, brightly dressed, older black man who came out, and he said, Oh, good to see you again. You've finally come. And we're like, Okay, well, <laughs> this is the first time we're here. And he said, No, no, you were here long ago. And he said, you need to, uh, he said, it's, it's, I've been waiting. He then proceeded to tell us that we had been there in a past life, and that's why he was still alive. He was awaiting us to come there, and that we had come there in a past life. Long, long ago, he said, people from all over the world gathered together for a meeting on Andros, and he said it was at this place where he was, and he showed us the remains of a temple while we were there. Um, and his greatest sadness, he said, of all the things in his life, he was most sad that he had to sell a lot of the blocks from the temple building blocks, and they wound up on the 
uh, there's a British when it was originally the British hunt the uh, British Indies um, for the the Britons owned it and there was a I'm trying to remember the guy's name a, a famous Brit that lived on the island but he had a compound there so Mr. Roll sold a lot of the blocks from this temple to them to build his compound uh, but anyway he said he he was so sorry he did that but he said that we had been there with him and a lot of other people and he said oh many many thousands of years ago um and he immediately walked us around and gave us fruit right away he had planted all of those fruit trees and he said he'd been waiting for us all these years uh he actually was oh. on a national Ge- we brought the national geographic in after this and he was on their show briefly he was not in. It was like three years later. He was not in good mental condition three years later, uh, good enough to talk to them very much. Uh, but he had these tunnels that went down into the ground and various caves that went around there, and he said that's where a, a temple had been. It's kind of sad talking about it because he died a few years ago, um, and we I think he was 98 when he died. Uh, Wow. But anyway, yeah, interesting story. We met his grandchildren. Uh, they were there the second time. They were very glad to see us, too. Very friendly people. Um, the man was, was quite spiritual. He was well-known everywhere in the island. But they said, oh, he's got all these crazy ideas about the past. And he never mentioned Atlantis. We did, but he never used the word. Uh, he just said that it was one, there was once this great civilization there, uh, that he had been there and had reincarnated many times and that we had been there with him. Uh, and he did seem to recognize us. I will say that. He came right out and said he'd been waiting on us. And I actually quizzed the people who knew him well, and they said, no, oh, a lot of people had been up there to talk to him, but they had never heard that he had come out and said that kind of stuff to anybody. So I don't know how he knew um, um it's a, it, it, it's a great story, uh, but it's it's true. Uh, everything that I've just said is true. It, it's still a little sad uh, because oh, we yeah, weren't but, able to. Go ahead. Well, I mean, if his purpose was waiting for you, then he achieved his purpose. He achieved, he achieved his purpose. Uh, he wanted us to try to uh, get it more recognized, which in a way we have. Uh, to mm-hmm. get it resurrected, here's a here's an oddity uh, that comes up about this. Um, a couple years after we met Mr. Roll, the uh, the people that run the casinos at Nassau, uh, it's not it's really not Nassau. They're on um, uh, well, it's not New Providence Island, but it's where the Atlantis Casino is. Uh, but the people that run the casinos contacted us in Memphis, which is where I live. And they wanted us to assist uh, them to set up a tour between uh, – an Atlantis tour, to bring people over from Atlantis, to bring them to Andros, and to walk around. And they wanted to be able to – they wanted to kind of restore Mr. Roll's area so that they could get people up there and they could see a temple and other things up there. Uh, But the land – and we actually did try to do something with it. But the land ownership in the Bahamas um, it doesn't work the same way, and there was no way to determine who actually owned that land. Uh, so that kind of ended it. And then uh, in 2008, with the, collapse, the monetary collapse of everything, uh, the casinos down there had a hard time for several years, so they simply dropped it and didn't go further with it. There's wow. loads of stories I could tell you about this, about various groups that have gotten interested in it. Uh, the uh, Microsoft, uh, we, ne- we I, I hope we get somewhere toward the end about the last thing we found, which is not in those books, and it is the remains of what looks like, it, well, it's definitely temple remains, but it looks like a collapsed temple um, made out of marble and schist with with fluted columns and so on, but it's all collapsed and in ruins. Uh, about 40, 40 to 50 miles south of Bimini 
on the edge of the uh, Gulf Stream, but in high in a in a relatively high area, but it's still underwater. Uh, there's a temple there, and the Microsoft Corporation actually has uh, a rather large um, foundation that supports archaeological work, and they had uh, an individual contact us about looking at that temple site, which the Bahamas had uh, forbidden us to give anybody the precise location of the site um, because they changed their laws uh, because someone apparently um, salvaged a Spanish galleon and didn't tell them anything uh, about ah. it. A long involved story. But anyway, um, they they pulled all of the archaeological permits in the entire Bahamas and all the geological permits. And when they did that, that's right at the time the Microsoft contacted us. But in any event, they managed to go to this site and look at it. We hooked them up with the people who could take them there. They contacted the Bahamas government and got permission to go. And their idea was to go to this temple. And initially they told me, well, we want to try and totally restore it and resurrect it. And I said, well, look, it's in a horrible place. It's right where the uh, Gulf Stream high and low tide water rushes by. And it's in anywhere from 6 to 20 feet of water, depending on the time of day and the time of year. And they said, well, we thought we might actually build a dike around the entire thing. And I said, <laughs> no, you're not going to do that. And... <laughs> But they were they they then I told them you probably could you can if you can get permission you could pull it all out and resurrect it on a nearby island which there are n numerous islands near it uh, so they sent a guy down to look at it and I told him but I think this thing has been underwater for so long uh, and it has been it is so broken it looks like it collapsed almost like a massive ocean wave hit it and just knocked it over and it's in a giant teardrop shape that is about 360 feet long uh but it's like a wow. huge teardrop on the bottom pure white bottom sand it's just pure white and then right on it is this massive teardrop shape of this pile of polished schist and it's purple it's purple schist and it glows when the sun hits it uh, it's really sparkly uh and marble and a lot of it is polished it's got coral on the top but the stuff that's not exposed to the sun is polished uh and of course it's dirty and all that but it could be pulled up but i told him i think that would be a major undertaking so they did put a get a salvage permit on it uh they haven't done anything with it, and I just think the cost would be enormous. And then getting, you'd have to get a way to get people to come see it. I suggested they think about putting it on Bimini because it is a tourist destination. But anyway, mm -hmm. that's a whole other story. <laughs> There's loads of say. stories like this. There is well, another now, temple north of Bimini that's in the water that we saw and got loads of film on, uh, and it has a uh, a pediment a a beautiful marble pediment laying right on top of all these marble beams and so on. So there's lots of stuff there. But that one we found the story of, and there's a shipwreck under it. And it was in the 1800s. Somebody, uh, somebody very wealthy in Florida was having a, they had a temple in either Greece or Rome disassembled and shipped to them to put uh, in their backyard. And a oh, hurricane no. blew it off and it sank. Story. Oh my gosh! I know. Well, Very strange. So, so, so you guys went and saw the Bimini Road. Yes. And that, and but that led that... me to then. Oh my God! I, I, I really believed everything that the skeptics had written about the Bimini Road. I believed <laughs> that it was totally natural beach rock. That it was just a, a huge slab of beach rock laying on the bottom, on a on a relatively flat bottom. It had broken apart. And then slowly but surely, I started gathering all the background details, and I, I am at the point where I don't believe any geologists. I know that archaeologists and geologists lie. I just said the word <laughs> lie, L-I-E. They are deceptive, 
they lie, they hide information, and um, some of them are still around, and they know I say this, and uh, if they want to sue, you know, please do, because they they can't, because they know (laughs) that what I'm saying is the truth. So it started, the whole Bimini Road thing, the... It was found in 1968 by a biologist named J. Manson Valentine, Ph.D., head of the Miami Museum, um, and they thought it was a remnant of Atlantis. All right, so uh, shortly thereafter, a geologist uh, by the name of Wyman Harrison published a letter in, in uh, Nature Journal, which is a very prestigious journal, saying that, oh, he had tested the uh, the stones and they were all natural beach rock that he thought were a single slab. And he also mentioned that, okay, there are a number of uh, columns. This is another thing, roughly uh, 25 to 30 columns, stone columns, were found in the inlet at between the two main Bimini Islands. Bimini is actually two islands that are very close together, but there's an inlet that goes between them. So in that inlet, really you can walk out to them. They're still there. Most of them are. Uh, there are these columns that look like, uh, well, two of them were mar- fluted marble columns, fluted marble. So that they actually had illustrations of those in the Nature article, uh, he tested some of the other stone columns and concluded that they're concrete. Uh, he sent them to the Portland, the president of the Portland Cement uh, Organization, who said that this is a very ancient type of lime kiln cement. Lime kiln cement. So I mention this because it's a detail. So uh, that was one thing. So I found out later this guy, uh, Wyman Harrison, who was the first skeptical geologist who said that, oh, it's just natural beach rock. The reason that he did this, he was at Bimini at the time when this was all discovered. He was there working uh, under a contract for the Edgar Cayce organization under his fake name, uh, and he was there searching for gold, Edgar Cayce related that uh, there were 120,000 gold coins on Bimini, and there was probably the largest uh, gold vein anywhere in the world located at Bimini. And it just so happened that the gold vein went right up through that uh, inlet between the two islands. You've never heard any of this before, and it's not in the books, right? Right. <clears throat> yeah. yeah. Okay. So the the ARE had this geologist working there who was doing drilling and who was trying to validate the gold being there. And he also he knew about the columns and he'd looked at those. But when the information came up that, oh, my God, they discovered Atlantis here, uh, he immediately went out. He got one little piece of it and said it's beach rock. That was the extent of his work and said nothing to see here. This guy continued to go back. <laughs> Wyman Har- okay, it's Wyman Harrison. He he became known as his uh pseudonym was uh William Hutton. Uh he has his he's dead now. His website is called the Hutton Commentaries. It is still uh archived online. So you can still see this. Uh he did not want many people to come there, but anyway, Hutton's work has been uh repeatedly used by skeptics. So then Another group came in. A guy came in uh, from the, uh, say, the U.S. Geological Survey. This guy had a bachelor's degree in biology who was paid by a fella to come over and and do some drilling at the Bimini Road. Uh, His name is Eugene Shin. Shin came in, published an article, uh, made fun of everybody looking for Atlantis, saying it's silly, said that uh, it's all natural. He published an article in the Skeptical Inquirer just a few years ago saying that all the stones he drilled, it proved that they were all exactly the same. They all came from the same block. They all tilted toward the deep water, which would mean it's natural beach rock. He said they all did. 
he called Edgar Casey, Edward Casey. He said that Casey, that Casey said Atlantis was there in 6000 BC. He called. Uh, he made fun of Ernest Hemingway's brother, calling him Lester. This is all in the article in the Skeptical Inquirer. He said that all of the columns found at Bimini were proven to be Portland cement. Now remember, I told you that they were lime kiln cement and and marble, and that um, uh, that the original guy had sent off sent the samples off to the president of the Portland Cement Association, and the yeah. president of the Portland Cement <clears throat> Association said that it's an ancient form of lime kiln cement. So Shin says that it's Portland cement. Um, and then the final thing that I will say, uh, he actually did not find in his original study, which he doesn't give anybody, I'm willing to give it to people now, uh, he found that the stones did not all tilt toward the deep water. He just sent, And he told me that, oh, I just did all this for fun. There was no peer review, and I wasn't really careful. That I have that in writing from him when I was quizzing him about this. Uh, that he did it all for fun, yet he's constantly uh, asked about it and says, that, oh, no, no, it's all natural, and these people are all crazy. But during this time period, in while he was working with the U.S. Geological Survey in Miami, with the full knowledge of the U.S. Geological Survey and uh, the University of South Florida Geology Department and the geologists there, including the chairman of the department, he fabricated a number of fake stone artifacts and took them to Bimini and planted them around the, under the stones at the Bimini Road. And in an article that he did with a uh, archaeologist uh, that, where they also said that all, the, all these columns are just uh, cement, Portland cement, and that it's all just natural and we proved it was they had some illustrations of those that anything found there oh it's it's not of atlantis but in in his talk about fabricating these fake artifacts he said i was really hoping that some of these people would find them and then publicize it and then we could tell them that they were hoaxed now this is a so-called scientist who was working for the U.S. federal government with the full knowledge of all these people doing this. So that is the kind of stuff that people who are seriously looking for what's there, and I've never said any of this is Atlantis. I'm looking for what's really there. I got really interested in the search. I mean, we found 31 crashed planes. We found four or five ships and boats. We found lots of things that look archaeological on land and in the water, and that was our interest. We never said any of this is Atlantis. In fact, we don't say the Bimini Road is. The Bimini Road is very clearly a breakwater that formed a harbor probably four to 6,000 years ago when the sea level was that much lower. But there's a lot of other stuff that we found there, and no one will go look at it. So, But we're fighting this with them deliberately – planting fake artifacts, deliberately lying, saying that, oh, it's Portland cement, when it's not, and even in, and, but people don't read the original publications. Nobody will actually, even the scientists, they won't read it and say, you know, what they're saying here is not true, even in their own reports, it's not true. Why would they do that? Why are they lying? So I've quieted well, you down now. <laughs> Why are they lying? They're, well, scientists can't accept anything that is, you know, beyond their scope. And if they, if they, you know, if you look at research that is done not only in on Atlantis, but in in all areas of discovery of the history of mankind, they are they are absolutely so determined to not change history that they bury stuff, they ignore stuff, they make fun of stuff, they do the best they can to take anybody away from the truth and, and to keep them ignorant of the new things that are out there. I don't think they want to change textbooks. I think they want all the textbooks no. to remain the same. One of the examples that I've used, and this is in this new book with Andrew Collins that is months away, but um, it's like imagine 
standing in front of students for 30 years saying that the first people entered America uh, in 9600 B.C., they all came through across the Bering Straits. And you've said that for 30 years. You've written dozens of articles about that. You've written loads of textbooks about it, and you've taught it for 30 years. And then suddenly somebody comes along and says, you know, everything you've been saying is wrong. And there's a, there are psychological processes that go on. That is why it took so long for the Clovis first theory to really fade. It hasn't died yet. A lot of these people still believe that it was 10,000 B.C. or 9,600 B.C. and that, that there's something wrong, that everybody else is lying, that all this new evidence just can't be real. And it's, the philosophy is it can't be real, therefore it isn't real. This can't be, yeah. therefore it isn't. That's their that's their well, rationale. Well, look, we at the, have, look at the copper mines in, in oh, Michigan yeah. and Wisconsin. Nine thousand years they've been in production. Yep. And yet well, there was they, nobody here in North America until what ten, yeah. twelve thousand years ago. Nah. It is. It is. Um, it's a real problem dealing with them, and so we have essentially gotten to the point where we pretty much ignore them except for the ones uh, who are friendly. I have a number of archaeologists that are very friendly with me. They, in fact, some of the, a few of the very big names in American archaeology believe in Atlantis, they believe in the lost civilization, and they believe that Bimini and all that stuff down there is very real. And they all well, they say the same thing to us. We can't go look. We will never get a penny of funding. We will be fired from academic positions if we are involved in this. They simply well, say you, we can't do it. They will look at the artifacts we send them to, but they won't get their name associated with it. I mean, you you mentioned that at least in the book that that there is an area there that you really think. I mean, the, the part of Atlantis is actually above ground in the part of Cuba. Yes. Yes, the Cuba thing came up later. That was a- Andrew's idea, and I began um, – when I say later, I mean it, it came not initially in our search. It came up later. Uh, Andrew Collins had po- – he believed that the main island of Cuba was the main island of Atlantis. Now, if you go to Plato's story – so let's talk about Thera for a minute. Thera and Santorini are the same island. They're off of Italy and Crete. Uh, it's mm-hmm. a, it is a circular island, and it is the remains of a volcano that erupted, I think, in around 600 B.C. or so. Uh, it's got a big um, hole in the middle that's filled with water. So, And they've also found the Minoan culture there, and they found the remains of temples <clears throat> Excuse me, and the temples, some of them have uh, bulls. So they've said, well, this must have been Atlantis because Atlantis was, according to Plato, a cult that worshipped bulls, which is not really true. Uh, that they had temples, which is true, and that it's a round island. Well, Plato's center city of Atlantis was not a round island, it was a round city that was on an island that was 340 by 225 miles. It was on the southern part of the island. It had these mountains to the north. It was a tropical island that had two growing seasons that grew a lot of tropical fruit. That's all in Plato's story. And this and this center city was made from a natural hill. It started with a natural hill that was built up. And this natural hill had a large, it was called the Acropolis, had a huge temple built on it. The hill was a half mile in diameter. And then around this were three concentric canals or circular canals that were made. And And those three canals caused two bands of rings of earth around the center. There were canals that came down from the mountains that fed the waters around the center city, and then there was a six-mile-long canal made from the center city to the ocean to the south. Mm -hmm. So Andrew Collins, in his book, believed that it was Cuba, and he was looking at an island called the Isle of Youth, which is in south, 
which is a, another island to the extreme south of Cuba. But I started doing some research and searching, looking for the – actually, it was because I was initially looking for uh, Indian mounds and the mound cultures in Cuba, which they were also in all the Caribbean islands. And then I found that there are, in fact, mound cultures in Cuba that had built canals, and there were ancient canals that – no one really knew the origin of in Cuba, and they were along these mountains that run through the center of Cuba, and the canals then run to the south. So I, on Google Earth, I began doing some research, and I actually followed these canals that made a crisscrossing pattern down to the south, and this is basically the exact center of Cuba. If you go to the center of Cuba, Havana would be on the left-hand side. Go to the center and go due south. In the middle of Cuba, there's a large mountain range that runs east to west. <clears throat> and then you go south, there are canals. And all those canals lead to this peninsula called the Zapata Peninsula. At the Zapata Peninsula, there is this circular formation in the middle of water where the canals all lead. And then it leads, this circular formation leads six miles down then into the ocean, which in all of it matches Plato's description. Plato's entire center city was a little over two miles in diameter in this island. And the center of this circular formation at Zapata was two miles in diameter. Well, when I found this, I said that, my God, this looks like Plato's center city of Atlantis. So I began looking for all kinds of depth soundings, and the only thing I could find anywhere were these old charts made by the British back in the 1700s and 1800s, where they had gone in there and done sounding on the bottom. And they showed that it's very clear there are these like rings, elevated rings in this circular area, and the middle is relatively higher, but this is submerged. It is an area that is a UNESCO World Wildlife Site. It is very close to the Bay of Pigs, not too far from there. And for about the past, uh, I'd say, eight years, we have been attempting to go to this place, and eventually, um, I say probably, I better say probably, eventually we will probably be able to get in there and look at it. But so far, we have been unable to do it. Loads of people have said, oh, yeah, you can do that. The government will let you. The governments will not allow it. Uh, there are no tour operators, no dive operators, no boat operators. You can't get a boat to go in there. Um, and do what we want to do. But sooner or later, I think we probably will. But that looks like Plato's center city. I became convinced through Andrew Collins' work that Cuba probably did serve the basis of Plato's Atlantis. Remember, Plato said, and Casey's Atlantis, Plato said that uh, Atlantis was on this large island, but there were many other islands, and you could hop from island to island until you reached the opposite continent. And, of course, in the Americas, there's always been a great mystery about where did those civilizations, how did they emerge, what was their origin, and Atlantis certainly seems like a good solution to that question. Oh, my God, yeah. Has, has there never been any archaeological studies no. done in this area? None, not a thing that I can find. The expert on it uh, has not actually even been out in the water. There are actually uh, saltwater crocodiles <laughs> in it, but that doesn't mean you can't get in it. Uh, and we've oh, yeah. been in lots of water that had crocodiles. When we went to the uh, Piedras Negras in Guatemala, there were um, freshwater crocodiles all over. In, the, in fact, we slept on the sandy beach along the Asuma Center River in sight of the crocodiles that were sunning themselves on the beach. <laughs> but we had to stay there. <laughs> we we filmed that too, along with a lot of other strange things that went on there. I can imagine. So so in order to get in there you have to get permission from a country that isn't giving permission. 
Well, we have um, to get – I believe it's military in nature that we cannot get in there, but um, we have to get permission from the Cuban government, uh, and we have to get permission from the United States. And it is uh, – and I mean, I'm willing to spend a lot of money, but when I say a lot of money, I'm not willing to spend what somebody like the National Geographic might be able to spend to go in and do it. Uh, mm-hmm. This is – I mean, we've we have – uh, sunk a lot into this, and it's been a quest. You you started this sort of by saying it was an adventure, and it has been an adventure. Uh, we got oh, our yeah. own boat. We got our own boat that was is a catamaran that is very fast and carries a lot of fuel and has so many safety measures. Uh, we had a lot of strange experiences when we were there. One I, one I will mention: the only time. In our entire trips where our camera simply the, – the film just didn't take for some reason. We used actual film, uh, mini-DV film is what it was. But we were – we had our boat along with what we call a mothership. We had a large liveaboard ship, and then we had our fast catamaran, which has a um, – it can go in the water that's a foot deep. Uh, but uh-huh. it can also go 60 miles an hour. Uh, and it, like I said, is very safe. It's been totally swamped before, and was just fine, even with a huge wave going over it. But anyway, we were we would take this boat out and search in the shallows. And meanwhile, our liveaboard boat or our mother boat would then go to designated coordinates and wait for us to come in that night. So there was the second day we were out. We were searching in and out the inlets uh, on Andros. The mothership, of course, couldn't get into those shallows, so it was about 25 miles offshore. But it was supposed to go, it was supposed to move roughly 40 miles that day and then meet us in deeper water. We wound up uh, around 6 o'clock at night getting to the spot, exact spot where we were supposed to meet them. And we were low on fuel. Now, our little catamaran carried 95 gallons of fuel. Uh, which would take us a couple hundred miles, but we uh, had used almost all of our fuel. We probably had five to ten gallons left, Uh, and we were about 150 miles from the nearest fuel station. So we we dropped anchor and were awaiting, and we used our – we had two radios. We had one very powerful marine radio. We called them over and over, nothing. We had a backup hand radio. We had two backups. We have backups of backups on almost everything. And we sat there, and we waited an hour. It was starting to get dark. We called them again. The water was so smooth that you could not – it was like glass. And when it gets this way and there's no clouds in the sky, you can't see a horizon, nor can you see where the water is. There was no land in sight. The sky is reflected in the water, and they both look exactly alike. It's very eerie. I mean, it's it's totally silent. And so we were trying to figure out what to do, and I had a plan. We we could have gone about 10 miles out into the Gulf Stream and then just drifted north through the night, hoping that a ship didn't run into us, and then the next day hopefully drifting far enough to make it. But I told my wife, pull out the camera, and I sat there, and I remember – to this day the exact words I said now this is how people disappear into the Bermuda Triangle <laughs> and I, proceed, I thought man we're making, a fil- we're making films in all these and we've made a lot of films and I, this, this is going to be great assuming we live and so yeah. I said those words and then I explained what had happened and I said the plan and I said we'll put our film canisters uh, in plastic and make sure that they can't get wet and so on but Anyway, this is what we did. And it's mainly stupidity why people disappear in the Bermuda Triangle, <laughs> pilot error and stupidity. Yeah. So okay. uh, it was around, we were just getting ready to pull up anchor and go out. And it was around 7.30, 7.45 or so on the radio again. I pulled out the hand radio, couldn't hear a thing when we talked and then we were just getting ready to start the engine and then I heard a click on the hand radio. Just a click, a little minor click. So I got on it and called. The big one didn't do it. Couldn't hear a thing. Got on it again and talked and then 
took my finger, you know, you take your finger off of it, and then you hear, I heard a couple of clicks, just very indistinct clicks. And the guy from the Bahamas with us, who's really an expert, he said, well, let's wait a minute. And we waited, and then the click got louder, but it was only a click. And then you can see about eight miles. You can see about eight miles with curvature of the earth. And then we saw a man. A guy about eight miles. You can see with the binoculars, a guy about eight miles away in the water, standing on standing on the water, which he wasn't standing on the water. And then he got higher and higher. He had climbed up the mast as high as he could on our mothership. It had a oh, really wow. high mast on it. And he had climbed up there, and he was waving like crazy because they could hear us on their radio, but we couldn't hear them. Their, their uh, ability to transmit to us was gone. Their radio had fried that way, but they could hear us. So wow. we, we could see that guy. So, all right. But anyway, we had that film. So here's, here's the, the, the part of the story. We had filmed that really the bizarre way the water was looking like glass, and it didn't move, and it just looked really you got strange. three minutes here. <laughs> I know. Well, I'm at the end of this. So we get home. Okay. And I'm, I'm really anxious. Nothing. That's oh, wow. the only film we've ever done. Nothing. Just blank. It's never happened wow. before or after. We, both, we were very good at using these cameras. And that was the one piece of film that I really wanted people. I mean, we have film of five water spouts at the same time close to our boat in in this horrible storm. And there's these five water spouts all visible at the same time, pretty much in the same place. Uh, so we and we've seen bizarre lights in the sky at night, loads of blue, red, green, white lights. Uh, popping on and off in the sky, lights in the water, which, of course, that's all been explained. But it's a very strange place. We've had a lot of things happen. Like I said, we found 31 planes, including three that were lost in the Bermuda Triangle. So it has wow. been an adventure. So so we've got a couple of minutes here. So if people want to get a hold of you or contact you, how do they do that and where do they go? Well, I am on Facebook, and I'm under Gregory L. Little. I'm on Twitter too, but I don't I don't use Twitter for that. Uh, that's where I put things on about my profession. But otherwise, APMagazine.info is the best place. APMagazine.info, or they can contact you, and you can give them our website. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, I will make sure I do that along with where to get your books <clears throat> because right. they are they are magical and they are wonderful. I want to thank you so very, very much for being here tonight. This has been fascinating for me and, and you know, it 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 is in it's enlightening to anybody who is an interest in Atlantis, you know, to to hear more details as to what Edgar Casey actually did put out there because there's so much more than than anybody actually realizes it's it's an amazing topic it's a fascinating culture and suggestion it, it and atlantis is alive within our imaginations even if you can't physically do it but i believe there is a lost culture out there and if you want to call it atlantis go right ahead because i think that that there is something that our our history has not even given us a hint of of what is there. And it's so sad because to take away people's imagination takes away the possibility of phenomenal things. Yeah. You know, Edgar Cayce said he'd be back the year 2158 in Nebraska. So (laughs) that's a ways away. Mark that date. Mark (laughs) that date, yes. Yes. Everybody plan on being back here then. Mark that on your calendars. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, it it has really been a pleasure. We can do it again. And I told you I can talk a lot. I could um I'll talk people's ears off if they want me to. Well, I you know, it it wasn't painful if that's what you did and and it was it has definitely been a pleasure. I can't thank you enough and of course you're coming back, especially with your new book. Oh, there you so, go. Wonderful. And okay. and when you actually get to find Atlantis. Oh, yeah. Good well, night, we'll, 